Good morning. If we haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Taylor Sutton. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my privilege this morning to continue on in our series in the book of Leviticus. So I would invite you to turn there now, uh, Leviticus chapter 12. Leviticus chapter 12. And we're actually considering a fairly long section of Leviticus this morning, uh, from Leviticus 12 all the way to the end of chapter 15. And this whole section, although it has four chapters, it's really solving one problem. And the problem is, how does an unclean people draw near to a holy God? So with that problem in mind, uh, what I want to do is just read the first few sections of our text and then jump and read the the very last section. So we're going to start reading this morning in chapter 12, verse 1 of the book of Leviticus, and we'll go down to 13, 8, and then we'll jump to the end of 15. So follow along as I read God's Word. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As at the time of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Then she shall continue for 33 days in the blood of her purifying. She shall not touch anything holy nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying are completed. But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her menstruation, and she shall continue in the blood of her purifying for 66 days. And when the days of her purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb, a year old, For a burnt offering, and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering, and he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. Then she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who bears a child, either male or female. And if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When a person has on the skin of his body a swelling, or an eruption, or a spot, and it turns into a case of leprous disease on the skin of his body, then he shall be brought to Aaron the priest, or to one of his sons the priests, and the priest shall examine the diseased area on the skin of his body. And if the hair in the diseased area has turned white and the disease appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a case of leprous disease. When the priest has examined him, he shall pronounce him unclean. But if the spot is white in the skin of his body and appears no deeper than the skin, and the the hair in it has not turned white, the priest shall shut up the diseased person for seven days. And the priest shall examine him on the seventh day, and if in his eyes the disease is checked and the disease has not spread in the skin, then the priest shall shut him up for another seven days, and the priest shall examine him again on the seventh day. And if the diseased area has faded and the disease has not spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is only an eruption, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. But if the eruption spreads in the skin, after he has shown himself to the priest for his cleansing, he shall appear again before the priest. And the priest shall look, and if the eruption has spread in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a leprous disease. Turn now with me to chapter 15, verse 31, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Leviticus 15, starting in verse 31. Thus you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle. 
that is in their midst. This is the law for him who has a discharge and for him who has an emission of semen becoming unclean thereby, also for her who is unwell with her menstrual impurity. That is, anyone, male or female, who has a discharge and for the man who lies with a woman who is unclean. You can flip back to chapter 12 now. So I said a moment ago, this is solving a problem. How can an unclean people draw near to a holy God? Uh, We actually need to specify that a little bit. The question more precisely is, how can a physically unclean people draw near to a holy God? And I think it is precisely the physicality of the concerns that animate these chapters that makes them so foreign to us today, even perhaps troubling or offensive. Uh, These chapters raise a number of questions. Questions like, why does God care about these kinds of things? Or how about, what is it that makes something unclean? What's the rationale for this? Questions like, is God shaming people simply for being human? And maybe the the persistent question of Leviticus, what does this have to do with us today? So I hope to answer these questions or at least attempt to answer them this morning as we consider Leviticus 12 through 15. And to try and do that, let me just start by stating up front what I think the main message is. What is it that Leviticus 12 through 15 is saying to us? We can think of it this way, that the pollution of sin has extended to our very bodies. And so, in order to draw near to God, we need a cleansing that is just as extensive. The pollution of sin has extended as far as our very bodies. And so to draw near to God, we need a cleansing that extends just as far as the pollution of sin. So four chapters, there's a lot of material here, but basically we're dealing with three sets of regulations, three kinds of uncleanness that Israel needs to know about. The first one is the uncleanness that's associated with childbirth. The second one is in chapters 13 and 14, and that's simply uh, the uncleanness of various skin diseases and also uh, surface growths that kind of behave like skin diseases. And then chapter 15, which we read the very end of, uh, introduces the third category, which is simply various kinds of bodily discharges that are all associated with reproduction. So we've got three areas of uncleanness. And we want to look at this. We want to understand this. And so my approach this morning is going to be to consider this text from four different angles. The first angle is the regulations themselves. What are the regulations? The second angle is what is the rationale for these regulations? The third angle from which we want to look at these laws is what is the goal? What is the goal of the regulations? What are they trying to accomplish? And then lastly, number four, how do these apply? What do these have to do with us? So regulations, number one, rationale, number two, goal, number three, and then application, number four. And rather than trying to overview all four chapters, what I want to do is uh, drill down into chapter 12 as a kind of case study that will hopefully illuminate some of the basic principles that help, will help us make sense of the other three chapters. So let's jump into chapter 12 as our case study, first asking the question, what are the regulations? What's going on here? Well, really there's only three steps, and this is true of chapter 12, it's true of the chapters that follow. Uh, There are three things that Israel needs to do when they encounter, when they're afflicted with one of these kinds of uncleanness. The first step in the regulations is to identify the uncleanness. The second step is to separate it 
And then the third step is to purify the uncleanness. So identify, separate, and then purify. So look at chapter 12. You see the identification step uh, mainly in verses 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, if a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As at the time of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. And then verse 5 adds the term of uncleanness for having a baby girl. So in this case, the identification is pretty simple. Any mother of a new baby enters into a set period of uncleanness. We saw for uh, skin diseases in that little section of chapter 13 that with skin diseases, the identification is a bit more complicated. There's actually a number of uh, steps that the priests go through to diagnose what they're dealing with. But in both cases, whether straightforward or a little bit more complex, it's all the same basic idea. Identify when you have a case of uncleanness. Step two, we can see in verse four. Step two, again, is separating the uncleanness. Look at verse 4 in chapter 12. Then she shall continue for 33 days in the blood of her purifying. She shall not touch anything holy, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying are completed. So the, the woman who's in her time period of uncleanness after giving birth is prohibited here from touching anything holy, which would be anything in the sanctuary, or anything brought out of the sanctuary, and she's prohibited from entering the sanctuary. So there's a separating that happens. Uh, In the case of the skin diseases, it's even more severe. You can look in chapter 13, later on in the chapter, if someone is determined to be unclean with a a leprous disease, uh, they actually have to leave the camp until their leprous disease uh, resolves itself. So we identify... We separate, and then lastly, purify. And this is in verses 6 through 8 of chapter 12. So look at verse 6. And when the days of her purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb, a year old, for a burnt offering, and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. And he, the priest, shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. Then she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who bears a child, either male or female. So there's a a ritual that the woman has to undergo at the tabernacle with a priest in order to be fully restored to Israelite society. She's purified through sacrifices. So chapter 12 is short. And compact, but this same basic structure is how the rest of the regulations of chapter 13, 14, and 15 are laid out. You identify the uncleanness, you separate it, and then hopefully, if circumstances permit, in some cases, you purify the uncleanness, usually through sacrifice. So that's the regulation. That's the first step, the first angle from which we want to look at this. The second one, maybe the more, well, the far more perplexing one, is the rationale. What is going on here? What reason are these things considered unclean? Why are other things that might also be considered unclean to us not mentioned? What, what's the logic of the regulations? And uh, just to make things more interesting, the text really doesn't say It really doesn't tell us why certain things, what what is it that makes something unclean? And so because of that absence of an explanation, theories have proliferated. Uh, And it's hard to be certain about any one of them. However, we can rule out a couple. So let's start there. I think we can rule out hygiene as a rationale. Uh, It just doesn't map onto the things that are mentioned, nor does it map onto the things, the many things that are omitted. So it does not appear that keeping Israel healthy is the main animating rationale for something being unclean here. We can rule that out. The second thing we can rule out is morality as the rationale. What I mean by that is the things that make a person unclean in this section are not sinful. There's nothing wrong with having a baby. There's nothing wrong 
with having intercourse. And yet both of those things in this text make a person unclean in different ways. And likewise, the skin diseases are never described here as a punishment for sin. So when we see the word unclean in Leviticus 12 through 15, we should not equate it in our minds with sinful. So unclean does not equal uh, icky or disease-ridden, nor does it equal sinful. So what is the rationale? Why are some things unclean and other things are clean? Well, here, here is my humble, if perhaps tentative, proposal. Uh, I think the rationale may be this, that what makes something unclean is that it is a physical manifestation of the fall of humanity as recorded in Genesis chapter 3. So something is unclean if it is designated here as a physical manifestation of man's fallen condition as described in Genesis chapter 3. So Genesis 3, you'll recall, is the story of how Adam and Eve, living in God's holy presence, rebelled against him. They cast off his good and kind rule, and that rebellion plunged humanity into all kinds of disorder and brokenness and suffering, both as a result of the uh, effects of sin itself and also as a result of God's punishment on sin, both of which are described in Genesis 3. So here's the idea. Chapter 12, the reason that childbirth would be considered unclean, the reason why Uh, intercourse and all the reproductive organ concerns of chapter 15, the reason why those things are singled out as unclean is that in Genesis 3, part of the curse is that childbirth is now afflicted with pain. And the relationship between husband and wife is now disordered. And so these things are, are designated by God in Leviticus as marks of mankind's rebellion and fall and cursed status before God. What about skin diseases? Well, think about Genesis 3. What is the first thing Adam and Eve notice after they sin? Their nakedness. Their own nakedness, which they had not really been bothered by before, becomes a source of shame. And so the idea, perhaps, in chapter 13 is that to have your skin disfigured by these particular diseases is is a loaded reminder of the shame of Adam and Eve, of the disfigurement and the the, the recognition of nakedness of Genesis 3. And really, what we can say about all the blood, there's a lot of concern with blood in these chapters. We read a little bit in chapter 12. Uh, There's more of that in chapter 15. I think it's reasonable to, to say That the reason why blood leaving the body makes a person unclean is that to have blood leave your body is a sign of death. Leviticus 17 will say, uh, the life is in the blood, which suggests that to lose blood in a way that's not normal is a sign of life leaking away from you. Even if the condition is not medically dangerous, it's a, it's a symbolic symbol or signpost to the fact that the great consequence on Adam and Eve's rebellion was death. So what does this mean? What this means is God has designated in Leviticus 12 through 15 these particular representative marks of the fall as making a person unfit to enter his presence. It's it's not safe for a person marked with these reminders, these signposts of the fall of humanity. It's not safe for him or for her to draw near to God's presence in the tabernacle, in the heart of Israel's encampment. So, that's the rationale. What's the goal? We've considered the regulations. We've considered the rationale. I'm I'm making a tentative proposal that the rationale here is physical 
manifestations of the fall make a person unclean. But what is the goal here? What's the purpose? Well, that I think we actually do get a clue to. Flip back over to chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse 31, says this. Thus you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. Although it's stated negatively here, I think this implies that the goal of all of these regulations is to make it possible for people afflicted by these uncleannesses to draw near to God. That's the goal. That's the reason these are here, is to make it possible for Israel, even in their uncleanness, even in their fallen, broken condition, to still draw near to God. Because what God could have said was, you know what, you guys are so unclean, you're so defiled by your own rebellion, why don't you just pray, just close your eyes and pray to me. I'm going to stay far, far away from you. He doesn't do that. The whole premise, as we've seen, of the book of Leviticus is that God wants to dwell with his people. And so these regulations, like other regulations in Leviticus, are here to facilitate that. It's like the way that uh, scuba gear makes it possible for a person to draw near to a beautiful coral reef, or the way that uh, protective equipment makes it possible for someone to draw near to a nuclear reactor. God is in their midst. They are unclean. The purpose is to solve that problem. And one of the ways you see that reflected in the regulations themselves is that every category of uncleanness has a way back. That's what the purification is about. The purification is not medical. It doesn't actually fix the problem, which is one of its limitations because in the case of skin diseases, you can't do the purification rites until your skin disease clears up. So the purification rite doesn't fix that. What the purification rite does is it cleanses you before God through sacrifice in such a way that you can now come back. So the goal The goal of these regulations is not to keep Israel away or to make them feel bad about themselves. The goal is to facilitate, in spite of all the obstacles in the way, to facilitate their drawing near to God. And notice, and notice it's drawing near to God in their full embodied existence. So we don't want to just rush right past the physicality here. God is determined to have his people near him, body and soul, in spite of the fact that their very bodies reek, if you will, with the aroma of sin and death. Even still, God wants them near That's the goal of these regulations. So we've considered the regulations, proposed a a rationale, and considered the goal. What about application? What does this mean for us today? What are we supposed to do with this now? Well, let me suggest two broad areas of relevance. Uh, The first area of relevance, the first way in which I think this can help us, is it helps us view our bodies accurately. It helps us relate to our bodies correctly. I, I can think of two popular views of the human body that uh, have a lot of currency today. The first one basically says that the body is meaningless. The body is meaningless in this sense, that a human is most essentially a soul or maybe a mind, but the body is just sort of an unfortunate meat cage that the soul or the mind is stuck in. And this is as old as Plato, 
but it's also as new as modern gender theories that say your gender, your real gender, is what you feel on the inside. Your physical, biological body is irrelevant. So that's one view. The body is meaningless. But there's another view that also has a lot of popularity, which is that the body is your moral authority. And the idea here is, if you have a physical appetite or inclination, it's only natural. So follow it. Do what it says. It would be artificial, if not oppressive, for society to try to tell you not to follow the inclinations and the appetites of your body. So your body is meaningless, or your body is your authority. It's the arbiter of right and wrong. Now, I've stated these in pretty stark terms that would sound more at home in kind of a secular mind, but I think these views influence and subtly shape even the way that Christians think about the human body. We have our own Christian versions of the body is meaningless and the body is our authority. So what Leviticus 12 through 15 does for us is it gives us a better vision of our bodies. And we could think of it this way, that the body is meaningful but fallen. The body, according to Leviticus 12 through 15, is profoundly meaningful, but it is fallen. So it's meaningful because, as the rest of Scripture makes clear, we are not souls stuck in bodies. We are embodied souls. We are enfleshed spirits. Our bodies are an integral element of our very selves. It's the way God made us. But our bodies are also fallen. The rebellion of Adam and Eve and God's punishment on that rebellion has not left our bodies unscathed. So we would not be wise to just do whatever feels good, to just follow the inclinations and appetites of our body. It's not just merely short-sighted. It's actually going against the grain of reality. We are embodied souls. Our bodies are meaningful, yet fallen. So what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things. It means if if we are embodied souls whose bodies are meaningful but fallen, it means that you can honor God by taking care of your body. Like attending to your own physical health is not vain or superficial. It can become that, but, but in principle, God gave you your body. You are, in part, your body. So we take care of it. It also means, the fact that our bodies are meaningful but fallen, it also means that when you suffer physically, God cares. God sees. It's not as if God is going, that's so irrelevant. All I really care about is your sanctification. That's what I'm really after. Now, there's there's a truth to that. But taken to an extreme, that amounts to a Christian version of the body is meaningless. So when you suffer, when you are in pain, the God of the universe cares about your pain. Your physical pain matters to God because your body is meaningful, even though it's also fallen. Because our bodies are meaningful but fallen, it means that there has to be a way for you and I to be kind to ourselves without becoming obedient to ourselves. We have a really hard time keeping those together. Like, be kind to yourself, but don't become obedient to yourself. You weren't made to do whatever feels good, but there are times where you should, like, go to sleep because you're tired and not feel bad about it. So be kind to yourself embodied soul, but don't, don't make your body your master. It's a terrible master, even if it is a great and precious gift. So that's the first broad area of relevance. Leviticus 12 through 15 gives us a better vision for our bodies, that we are fallen creatures 
but our bodies are meaningful, even though they are also affected by that fall. Second, second broad area of relevance is simply this, that Leviticus 12 through 15 can help us set our hope more firmly on Christ. This section of Leviticus can help us set our hope more firmly on Christ. And here's what I have in mind when I say that. When we adopt, consciously or subconsciously, a false view of the body, it always leads to a truncated vision of redemption. If, if all that really matters is the soul, then the redemption that I look to Jesus to accomplish for me will be merely and exclusively spiritual. It will not affect or touch any aspect of my physical existence. But Leviticus 12 through 15 would caution us from so truncating our view of the redemption that Jesus came to accomplish. What, what we see when Jesus comes, when he comes in the Gospels, when, when he came 2,000 years ago, he didn't come and say, hey guys, I know there's a lot of stuff in Leviticus about the body. Uh, that was a bit much. You know, now we're going we're gonna to kind of tone that down a little bit. That really doesn't matter that much. What really matters is your soul. What really matters is your behavior. Like, we're, we're kind of moving past that now. No, Jesus did not set aside Leviticus 12 through 15. Jesus fulfilled Leviticus 12 through 15. He fulfilled it in two very important ways. He fulfilled it, first of all, by obeying it perfectly. Jesus obeys the law flawlessly in his earthly life. As a human being, he obeys the law, including Leviticus 12 through 15, without error, without fault. He also fulfills the law in another sense, which is that he fills out all the patterns in the law so as to bring the law to its intended destination. So he doesn't just come and say, we're past that now. He says, it's fulfilled in me. I fulfill the law, Jesus fulfills the law, so as to share that fulfillment with all who will trust in him. So when we think about Leviticus 12 through 15, it's not the case that when Jesus came, God chilled out and just lowered his standards for cleanness and purity. Rather, when Jesus came, he cleansed us so profoundly and so radically that the temporary purification measures of Leviticus 12 through 15 were no longer needed because the purpose of them had been fulfilled in Jesus. And we get a picture, we get a beautiful picture of this in the way that Jesus interacts with unclean people in the Gospels. There are parts of the Gospels that we will miss if we don't have Leviticus. Jesus talks to a man with leprosy, with an unclean skin condition. And what does he do? He touches him and the leprosy goes away. Now, a normal person, that would have made them unclean. But Jesus is rolling back the marks and the effects of the fall. You see with the woman who has a flow of blood, that's not just like an unfortunate medical condition, though it is that. We know from Leviticus 15 that that flow of blood would have made her unclean perpetually until it was resolved. And so she comes to Jesus just to touch the edge of his garment. And what happens? She's healed. The uncleanness is cleansed. Now listen, the point of these stories is not that Jesus will heal all your physical afflictions in this life if you just have enough faith. The point, however, is this, that the redemption that Jesus is bringing through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, through his return, the redemption that he is bringing will one day restore and heal and cleanse everything, bodies and souls. 
That's why the Christian hope is not to be a soul floating on the clouds. It's to be resurrected. Jesus is restoring all things. So, friends, uh, we are all dying. Every single one of us. We are all dying, and we will all suffer in the process. And so the question that every one of us and every one of our friends and neighbors is faced with is, what will we set our hope on facing such a daunting reality of our own mortality and vulnerability to physical suffering? What will we look to to make it okay? Some people look to delaying death. That's where they set their hope. Others look to minimizing pain and suffering. Other people look to maximizing pleasure or accomplishments in the time that they have. Now, none of those things are wrong in and of themselves, but all of them will eventually fail you. And so for everyone in this room and everyone you know, there is a question, what is your hope in? What are you trusting in? in the face of certain death and suffering. And what Christianity says, what the gospel says, is not, don't worry, you'll die and your soul will go to heaven. Although that's true. What Christianity says is Jesus is making all things new. He is restoring embodied souls to God. It it is not for nothing that the Heidelberg Catechism says our only hope in life and death is that we belong body and soul in life and in death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. We have found Christians. We have found a Savior that will carry us through death, through the very marks of the fall and the curse, and he carries us through to the other side where there is redemption, restoration, cleansing. So that is who our, that is what our hope is in. It's in Jesus. That is the Savior that we have found. And if you're not a Christian, that is what the good news of Christianity holds out to you. It is not just weak wish fulfillment. It is the answer to the most profound problem that has haunted the human race for millennia. So we need a cleansing. You and I need a cleansing that is every bit as extensive as the pollution of sin. And in Christ, we have it. And we will have it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we approach you now not because you are any less holy or pure than what we see reflected in the pages of Leviticus. Rather, we approach you now in and through the purity and the cleansing power of your Son, our Savior, our King, our representative, our champion, Jesus Christ. So, Father, would you hear us, hear us in our suffering, hear us and see us in our confusion, have mercy on us in our frail mortality. And Father, we pray in the name and the power of Jesus, would you carry us through, carry us through suffering and death. Carry us through to your kingdom, to the great day of resurrection when we will be with you. And all the structures and the pictures and the signs of the law of Moses will be perfectly fulfilled and our hearts will be satisfied. Lord, bring us to that day, we pray. Amen.